Paris, the information technology year, BBC Two begins a new series now that explores the world of information science in the computer programme. You may have noticed, 1982 is information technology year. There's a Minister of Information Technology, and the government is even spending a great deal of money on publicising it. But what is information technology? All it really means is the world of computers. But why have they suddenly become so important? And what should we, as non-computer experts, know about them? Well, that's exactly what I shall be finding out during this series. One thing I know already, don't expect the computer revolution to happen tomorrow. It's happening now. In many centuries, man has searched for tools to help him with complex calculations. I suppose the fingers were the first. Ten of them, they're easy to use, they're portable, but they're limited in application. Recently, a theory has emerged that this was built 5,000 years ago as a complex astronomical computer to calculate the movements of the sun and the moon. It sounds hard to accept, but if this really was a computer, I thought it'd be interesting to compare it with one of the early large-scale computers that were around in the 50s. There's many similarities. Firstly, very few people understood how they worked. At Stonehenge, you had to be a member of a hierarchical priesthood, and it took several years before you learnt its secrets. On the early computers, you had to have a degree in mathematics before you were even allowed through the computer room door. At the time Stonehenge was built, the society was mainly agricultural. Forecasting the seasons was vital. From the position of the rising sun in relation to these stones, the approach of spring and winter could be forecast. But if you wanted to reprogram Stonehenge to base the calendar on lunar cycles instead, the stones would have to be moved. It didn't take much less effort to reprogram those old, unreliable 50s computers, and within 10 years, they were replaced. Stonehenge lasted 1,200 years, but eventually, it too became redundant. This morning, we can see the sun. But the climate changed, and no longer was it visible on enough days to justify its existence. So it was abandoned and left to what it is today, a mysterious but rather magnificent pile of old stones. It was obviously important for a farming community to predict the seasons, but forecasting the weather was quite another matter. The trouble with the stones was their inflexibility. A modern computer can be used for a wide variety of applications, some of them extremely complex. For example, a prediction of weather patterns for the whole globe up to 10 days ahead can be produced in just four hours. The European Weather Center has one of the fastest and most powerful computers in the world. Its capacity for work is colossal. These metal megaliths have within them the power to collect weather information from all over the world of temperature, pressure, humidity and so on and process them at the rate of 50 million instructions per second and then with a great primordial burp out comes the weather for the next 10 days. Now just to put that in some sort of perspective if I were to do the same calculation single-handed even with the aid of a perfectly ordinary pocket calculator like that, I would need to have started well before Stonehenge was even thought of. Or to put it another way, if I gave the job to the entire population of China to share, the chances are they could do the job in four hours. But then, at the end of it, the chances are I wouldn't be able to collect the information even if I could speak Chinese. Now this here 
is the center of this colossal machine. This is the Cray. And you get the feeling in the presence of a mighty machine like that, that somewhere around the corner there lurks a high priest in white robes who's about to make some ritualistic sacrifice to appease the beast. But one of the purposes of this television series is to demystify computers. And so we can say, for instance, that a personal computer like that, which is, which puts computer power within the reach of everybody's pockets, it's highly advertised, is quite capable of doing the same sort of job as the same function inside, more or less in principle, as that does. The only difference is that it does it slower. So if we wanted to use microcomputers to do the same job as that, we'd need about a million of them. And in fact, there are over a hundred different makes of small computer now on sale in Britain. You can't have failed to notice the ads in the papers for them. Look at this one. Familiar faces make them seem the answer to the businessmen's problems. And you don't need a degree in electronic wizardry to use them, it says. And this supplement has no less than five ads for them. And they're all of them clearly directed at the family. Look at that. Give your child an unfair advantage at school. And there are many specialist computer magazines on the newsstands. Again, full of very tasty adverts. Inside a day, you'll be talking to it like a new friend, it says. And now they're even starting to appear in their own TV commercials. Out of space! But that's just the beginning! Beat the computer with the numbers game! Or even compose a symphony! There's over 36 different cartridges! And when you master the... And even when you leave the house, you can't get away from them. There are shops in the high street where you can buy a pet, an apple, an acorn, a tangerine, even a new brain. In fact, computers suddenly seem to be everywhere. I bet there's hardly a pub in the country which doesn't have a couple of computers in the lounge bar. Well, like it or not, they're with us for good, but I sometimes get the feeling that the only people who'll get any use out of them, apart from space invaders, are a few highly qualified boffins and some home enthusiasts who until 10 years ago would have been making their own television sets. Well, don't despair. This series will show that the computer is within the reach of anybody, including me. And the man who'll be ably helping us with the task is Ian McNaught Davis. Mac, you've been working with computers since Stonehenge was built, I think, haven't you? I thought you were going to come out with that remark about it being the first silicon chip. Is that what Stonehenge <laughs> is? Just about, yes. Well, I did program those early valve machines, which had several interesting characteristics. First, they were extremely expensive to buy. They were horrendously expensive to run. You needed a resident maintenance engineer just to keep the things going. And uh, they were very slow compared with modern computers. Just to give you an idea, it's a lovely analogy, but it turns out that the uh, Volkswagen uh, Beetle went into production at about the same time as the first large computer was made. And if that had improved in price performance as much as computers had, then you would have had a, a Beetle today doing 600 miles an hour, 30,000 miles to the gallon. It would have lasted 10,000 years without a service <laughs> and it would have cost you 50p. So you'd have had a disposable motor car. And in comparison with those early valve machines, that watch, which has got four games on it and tells the time, probably has as much logic in it as those very early old-fashioned valve machines. What's the secret of it? How has it happened? Well, strangely enough, it's this. Silicon. That's what sand is made out of. It's what the silicon chip is made out of. And unlike oil, we're not going to run out of it. Every country's got some of it, and it's extremely cheap. For example, the power of this machine here, which is a fairly sizable mini-computer, mainframe computer, yeah. one day will be on a chip. You'll get the same power out of a chip as you have in this mainframe computer. Amazing. And that will happen in a very few years' time. Right. Well, even before that day comes, computers are still doing some pretty staggering jobs, many of which we take for granted, and which would simply not be possible without computer power. They range from the obviously worthwhile to the downright sinister.
Jack, what is it that makes computers so very useful to us? Is it, is it that they're cleverer than we are? No, uh, they're quite stupid in many ways, but in certain ways they are very clever. They can handle a vast amount of information and they can handle it very rapidly. And what's more, they can keep on doing it without making any mistakes night after night after day after night and so on, which we can't obviously do. Right. Well, I can understand that being applied to sending a man to the moon or running the Pentagon or something, colossal, endless computations. But for an ordinary person who just maybe wants to run a small business or something, it's very confusing. We read ads in the paper, you could spend anything from £50 to £5,000 on a computer. But what use could I get from it? Well, of course, many of these are set up to show games. This one here, for example, and you can play silly games on them. There's a very important educational element of learning how to program these computers. First of all, it's fun. People enjoy it. And secondly, it's very creative. You can do very interesting and exciting things. It's boundless, the sort of things that you can actually use your creative imagination to do. And thirdly, it might turn out to be useful right. <laughs> for your business. And there's no business that I can imagine that at some time or other won't find the use for a computer. Right. Now, supposing I wanted to use a computer for my business. I'm a freelance journalist. I mean, let's take my example as maybe a, a typical one. What gear do I need? Because there's a terrifically wide range of choice. Well, of course, you need the computer with a keyboard, yes. something like this. You need a, a video screen. You need a straightforward cassette recorder to store your programs on as much as anything. Right. Obviously, you need a printer here for printing out your letters. And if this was a bit slow, the cassette recorder is a bit slow, you can buy yourself a, a disc unit, which is a lot faster, and that stores it on a disc instead of on the ordinary magnetic cassette. And that's the equipment you'd need. Right. Well, business, as Max said, and particularly small business, is the fastest growing area to which personal or micro computers are being applied. Now, our reporter, Jill Neville, has been finding out just how small some of those businesses are. Buying sweets or chocolates always requires serious study. There's so many different sorts to choose from. What we've got. Now the, those are ten. Those, those are, are ten. ten. Or you've got something there at sixpence, and you've got Because there are so many varieties on the shelves, the shopkeeper must do an awful lot of bookkeeping, both to check the stores and to keep up the orders to all the suppliers. In addition, Phyllis Arundel wanted to know more frequently than her accountant could tell her her precise financial position. She'd seen microcomputers advertised and decided that she too must have one. But not all sweet shop owners have a computer. Once you actually had the computer here and yes. you had that keyboard and the blank screen facing you, weren't you rather apprehensive? No. You knew what to do already, did you? Well, uh, I mean, it looked like a typewriter, didn't it? And I could operate a typewriter, and I was fascinated by the little bits that came up on the screen in front of me, and having a printer and able to press another button, and it, it came out on the printer at the side. It was great fun. Now, has it actually helped you in your business, do yeah. you think? Well, it hasn't financially uh, helped. It hasn't brought in more custom, which is what I would need. But what it has done, it's made, uh, it's given me a lot more time. I mean, the, the, the jobs that took ages, you know, but manually, uh, 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 now it's done in seconds. To keep up to date with her 40 sweet suppliers, VAT and the bank, used to take Phyllis Arendelle several hours bookwork every night. And that's the last thing you need after 10 hours on your feet. Now, at the end of each day, it's simply a matter of checking the day's takings and entering them and the invoices into the computer. Once a week, she also enters details of any transactions with the bank, and the computer will then give her an up-to-date statement of her current financial position. Because she'd found it so useful, Phyllis thought that a computer might help other people with small businesses. So, a year ago, she started up a computer service to take over their paperwork, allowing them to get on with their jobs. Do you see, do you think, the computer side of your business ever taking over from the chocolates? I hope so. Yes, it'd be great fun, because uh, at the present time, the chocolate, uh, this business is... Um, 
sort of going down because we've got a new bypass and it's uh, affected trade. And uh, in any case, I find that more exciting. I find the computer business much more exciting. Well, I reckon if Phyllis can get to grips with a microcomputer, then I jolly well ought to be able to. But, Mac, have I got to be able to program a microcomputer in order to get some value from it? Not necessarily. You can buy a magazine, for example, and get program listings. I love this one with the bug-eyed monster <laughs> and the lights coming out of its eyes. Yeah. And in here, they publish all manner of different sorts of programs, and they list them out for you. And you have, what do you do? You type all that into the computer? You type it all in without one mistake, and one mistake will ensure that it will never work. Right, well, that's pretty laborious business, isn't it? Well, you can buy it, of course, on a, on a cassette. Yeah. Just an ordinary household cassette like this. That's just a perfectly ordinary domestic cassette. And yes. presumably that's the same in principle as the proper big computer has, like James Bond films, has big tapes rolling backwards and forwards. It's the same sort of thing. That's exactly the same. Well, in principle it's the same. That's running about 250 times the speed of that, and they can run up to 8,000 times the speed of that. Things in computers don't happen 10 times or twice as fast. It's always 100 times or 1,000 times as fast. But for our purposes, this is just, it's perfectly good. We have a program in there, and we can put it into the machine. Well, let's do it. All right, so far so good. There's a perfectly ordinary domestic cassette recorder. Exactly. OK, connected to this. Now, what happens next? Well, we have to load the program into the machine. So you type, load. L-O-A-D. Now, we've got to give it the name of the program. So, in, in this particular machine, we have to use quotation marks to right. give it the name. So, okay. quotation marks, and the name of the game is Wall. It's the old Wall game. Right. Now, we must switch on the cassette. Yes and then hit return. And that puts the control back to the computer. And now it's beginning Searching. to search. Right. Now, presumably, as you said, this is a fairly slow and laborious way of, uh, of doing it, and we could speed things up by using one of the floppy disks you were talking about earlier. Yes, on a floppy, this, this, will, this is about 130 times the speed of that, and, of course, it costs correspondingly more. So this takes minutes and that takes seconds? Yeah, it'll take half a minute, so that would take being in flash. No right. time at all. Right. Now, but how do we know it's finished? Well, we've got the, uh, the symbol back here, and that shows the computer's waiting for you to uh, do your next thing. So that, that's in there. That's it. So, so we, we can, can switch it off. That. And presumably we can check, can we, that what was on there is in there now? Happily, yes. All you have to do is to type out list and it tell you what's in it. List, L-I-S-T. L-I-S-T. Return. As you wow. Know. OK, that's and the that program exactly that was. And that's exactly what it's read in from that cassette. Right. Right. Okay, well, we've got, we know it's in there. How do we play the game? Just tell it to run. Run. Nice, simple English words, I must say. And return, I suppose. That's it. And you should be in the game. It works. Right. Wall game. Move the bat. Left with the Z key, right with the X key. Try to knock all the bricks out with the ball. Bricks to the further back score more points. You're allowed three balls, large or small bat. Well, I have an L bat. As a beginner. Press any key to serve. Right. It's a multicoloured game, that. I, I see, I see. Yes, <laughs> right. I think I get the picture. Oh, I hope you're better at tennis than you are at this. <laughs> <laughs> it's so simple to play. OK, well, obviously, it's not just for playing games. They're terrific fun, but there must be more to it than that. I really hate to see computers just used for playing games. It, to my mind, it's kind of degrading when they could be used for much more serious purposes. And, of course, there are millions of uses for them, m many of which we're going to look at in this series. For example, you can actually use this to communicate with much larger scale computers through telephone networks. You can use it to communicate with other people who own micros, and you could use it to communicate with, with databases. Yeah. And that's what I'm going to show you right now. All right. And we're going to access the database, and we do this by typing star prestel. So it's star prestel. Prestel. We're now dialing prestel automatically through the ordinary telephone lines, and we can access enormous databases, everything from the current share price to weather forecasts and so on. And key something or other to continue. That's so. the old hash up there, which is a shift and a hash. Oh, hash. <laughs> what would you like to do? Well, I've, we thought about this before the programme started, and I've decided I want to fly to Paris. One ticket. Mm. Oh, what a shame. <laughs> well, there we go, travel. And number two. OK. Two. Uh, and Presto. Presto. I've never heard of that airline, but I'll take a chance. Oh, we don't want to book a real ticket on one of the others. Uh, I see. Now, we're going to Paris, so presumably I 
Put one in there, and one if that's where the little hash flashing hash. thing is, that's where it's going to come. All right, one. And a hash. And a hash. Economy, one. Hash, who in the hang of this? Date of travel, the 11th of January. That's 11.01. Oh. Just like that. Yep, that's it. I hope it works. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Now, I hope you've got a seat for me on the half past six flight to Paris this evening. Hi, sir. Can I have your name, please? So, S E R E. Hello. Yes, sir. The VA three one six at eighteen thirty. Uh, how would you like to pay? Uh, by credit card. The fare is sixty four pounds. Well, obviously Heathrow is computer land. The planes now fly with so many passengers over such colossal distances. It's just enormous speed. Airlines depend now completely on computers because the only way they can sell tickets reasonably cheaply is by having full planes. And the other luxury of this colossal computer network is that I can cancel at any time I feel like it, right up to five minutes before the flight closes. And anybody else in the country or in the world can have the same seat on the same plane. What's more, without computers, the chances are this ticket to Paris could cost as much as a thousand pounds. Before we get carried away with enthusiasm for these miracles of technology, perhaps we should consider a more objective view. Author and journalist Rex Malik has been observing and writing about the computer world for more than 20 years. And where does he think it's leading us? It's leading us to major change. Uh, some would say as unprecedented change has occurred during the first Industrial Revolution. Now, if you're going to understand the nature of that change, you'd better understand something of the nature of the, of the technology which fuels it. In this program, they've shown you the K1, the weather center computer, a supercomputer. Yet, in comparison to what's to come, that isn't even the equivalent of a Model T Ford. The Japanese have just started a program to build a computer a hundred times as powerful. That program, they say, will take about 10 years. Okay, so it slips, say 20. That means very simply that at the end of 20 years, almost everybody will have one, or access to one. Now why? Well, because it's going to be made out of microelectronics. And it's in the nature of microelectronics that 90% of your costs come up front, i.e. it costs you 90% of the total to build the first one. Thereafter, you can shell them out like peas. So everybody has one. That means that a 15-year-old at school today, by the time he's 35 to 45, is going to have almost unbelievable brain and memory power added to aid him in his work. And there's another question. What people are going to use it for? Well, in fact, you're going to find that most of the time that computer's going to sit there idle. It's going to be parked just like the cars parked at the curb. Sometimes it'll go to top speed, but very seldom. Now, the question now becomes, it's not that uh, do computers have social consequences, it is what are the social consequences of computers? What are the issues that are raised? And remember, we're talking about a computer of a hundred times the most powerful computer on the planet, and yet it's essentially built out of the very same technology that Chris booked his holiday on.
A BBC publication entitled The Computer Book, which explains what computers can do and how they work, will be available from bookshops from this Friday, the price £6.75. And for details of the materials and equipment available, including the BBC microcomputer system and the linked NEC correspondence course in programming, please send a stamped addressed envelope at least 12 inches by 9 inches to Broadcasting Support Services, PO Box 7, London W3 6XJ.